Good morning. Y'all have a very good sound system here. I just want you to know I like it a lot. I think even when I speak in my regular voice, you can hear me. So that's the sound of a really good, that's a sign of a really good sound system. Uh, welcome to God, Our Shepherd. And uh, this will be four weeks during the month of October, continuous. We're not taking any breaks. And um, I just want to share with you a little bit about my vision and why I wanted to do this. I think we're all familiar with the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And we're also pretty familiar with um, Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. And apart from that, I don't know that we ever got to get a lot of context for that. Uh, we just think that, you know, David dropped his psalm in and it was a great analogy and Jesus maybe picked up on it and, and you know, we, we kind of get it. But um, what intrigued me is that the concept of God, our shepherd, predates all of that and is really steeped in the culture. And um, so my hope and my vision is to bring you some insight, maybe not so much factual information, but some perspective and some insight on God, our shepherd, that you didn't already get in your multiple studies of Psalm 23 or the sermons you've heard on I am the good shepherd and that sort of thing. So with that in mind, um, I started with the big picture. And um, I had no idea until I set out to do this that there are nearly 400, some say more than 500 references to sheep or flocks in the Bible. The most frequently mentioned animal in the Bible. You know, so now if I go to trivia night, I'm going to be well prepared. By the way, I did go to a trivia night and my team won. Because I brought all the old knowledge. They were young people. Um, and, you know, the, we'll go deeper, a little bit deeper into this. But basically, the high incidence of sheep and shepherds is... Um, Maybe attributable to the fact that sheep were and continue to be tremendously important in the life of people uh, back in first century Palestine and the surrounding areas, and even today in that Middle Eastern area. It was a nomadic and an agricultural life, and sheep were so much a part of that economy and that lifestyle. And then there are the qualities of the sheep and the shepherds uh, that make them good sources of metaphor. Um, I recently preached on the unworthy servant parable from Jesus. I have decided we servant parables are not our favorite. We'd much rather have a sheep parable. <laughs> but the shepherd is a powerful image of a leader, uh, a leader with special qualities that the people in that space and time knew about. And sheep are also very, very special, even if we don't want to be compared to them. So um, Genesis is where we find the first reference to God as a shepherd, and we'll talk more about that. Through the Old Testament, Israel is called God's flock, and many of the major figures in the Old Testament were, in fact, shepherds. Um, we know David was a shepherd. Um, Abraham was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. Um, and the shepherd metaphor became uh, a standard, if you were, to compare the kings of Israel to whether they were doing well or not doing well. And it became a metaphor of critique against these human kings. And they were criticized for not being good shepherds. We're also going to look more into that. Jeremiah saw a time when God would appoint shepherds for them who would shepherd them so that they would no longer fear and tremble. So that language, which was rooted in their culture, he is still envisioning into the future of a new shepherd. Uh, in the New Testament, Luke has shepherds receiving the heavenly message. John 10, as we talked about, contains Jesus as the good shepherd. And at the end of the gospel, Jesus also applies <coughs> uh, the imagery to Peter um, as he tells Peter to feed his sheep and tend his lambs. So that's your, your big flyover of um, shepherd imagery in the Bible. I mentioned that Genesis contains the first biblical reference to God as a shepherd. It's near the end of his life where Jacob, who is also called Israel, 
uh, was a blessing, was blessing his sons, and he gives Joseph his blessing, and um, he blesses Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and he spoke of God as his shepherd. And so this is what he says. May the God whose presence my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd from my birth to this day, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on the earth. So that's really the first introduction that we hear. And you could have read that story a million times and never known the significance of um, this forefather saying that the God who has been his shepherd from his birth until this day. And then um, we see that Abel was the first shepherd. So Genesis 48 is the first reference to God as shepherd. But shepherd is mentioned earlier in Genesis. And um, later the people of Israel would be frequently referred to as a flock, especially when they went to stray. May the Lord, the God of all spirits, of all humanity, set over the community someone who will be their leader in battle and who will lead them out and bring them in. That the Lord's community may not be like a sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, and then I see all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord is saying, these have no master. Let each of them go back home in peace. So again, we're just sort of putting our toe in the water about how sheep and shepherds are used in the earliest of the biblical books. David, who was recruited by God to be a king, or the king, um, was a shepherd, and we know that because it tells us. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So David came straight out of shepherding sheep to receive his anointing uh, as king. Now he had to grow up and all that kind of stuff. But um, he was anointed. Now you're familiar with the Psalms. Many are attributed to David. Uh, and it is the Psalms are full of shepherd symbolism. We know the Lord is my shepherd. Um, we also can find, for he is our God, we are the people he shepherds, the sheep in his hands. Again, the, the Psalm 23 didn't just drop down out of context, and neither did Jesus as a shepherd drop in. Um, Moses is portrayed as a shepherd who led his people like a flock. Moses' successor, Joshua, was designated to lead the people, quote, so that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep without a shepherd. So as we're going through these little hits of sheep and shepherd, we're getting a pattern that people need to be led, that the quality of their leader matters, and that there is something about shepherds that is a good metaphor for the leadership that God wants. For his people and um, that God does not want his people to be without a shepherd now I don't know if you remember this from any of our other times together but if for a long time Israel had no king and they clamored to God everybody else has a king everybody else is going to homecoming you know <laughs> we need a king Emily's family is going to the river. Why aren't we going to the river? They clamored and clamored for a king. And uh, God put some judges in their midst so they could have a mediator of justice and, and things around them. Um, but the way I understand the biblical story of how the Israelites got a king is that God said, I want to be your king. I am your king. You don't need any other kings. They said, well, we need somebody with skin on. And so God uh, lifted up kings. But um, 
I wonder where we would have been if we'd stuck with God as shepherd and as a human culture, never gone the king route. Just something to think about. Because a shepherd is a particular kind of leader, and even kings in the Bible are measured against how well they shepherd. Um, the prophets also spoke of God as a shepherd who feeds, guides, and protects his flock. He comes with power, the Lord God who rules by his strong arm. Here is his reward with him, his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he feeds his flock. In the arms, he gathers the lambs, carrying them in his bosom, leading the ewes with care. This is an important passage, this Isaiah vision, because it just doesn't say shepherd and leave it there. It has two powerful activities that are being done. This image of God as shepherd teaches us that God loves us tenderly. In his arm, he gathers the most vulnerable and frail, the lambs. And he looks over and watches his flock, and then carrying them in his bosom is a very powerful image of love and care and concern, and I would say beyond which we would even think a king might offer, but a shepherd does. And so besides Psalm 23, there are some other passages that refer to God as the guiding, protecting, saving, and caring shepherd. And um, I'm not going to go through all of these with the same amount of importance, but I wanted you to see them. I want you to have the visual, and then you can read through them. Um, Jacob gathers his sons to tell them what the future holds. And he, uh, again, in the presence of Joseph, he says, Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility. And we're kind of remembering how his brothers tricked him and sold him into slavery. And, but his bow remained steady. His strong arms stayed limber because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Because of your father's God who helps you, because the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the skies above. So God is the rock of Israel. He is almighty and he blesses, but first he is the shepherd. That's, that's the way this hits us. You can go through the Psalms um, 74, 77, 78. Um, 78 says he brought his people out like a flock he led them through like sheep through the wilderness so that's both God and Moses right and Moses is the man on the ground but God is doing the leading um, Psalm 80 hear us shepherd of Israel you who lead like who lead Joseph like a flock you who sit enthroned between the cherubim and shine forth Psalm 100, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. We already talked a little bit about Isaiah 40. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. Um, then there's the passages of Micah. Um, we're sort of so we've gone from the big picture. We've seen a lot of verses. Now we're kind of uh, going to hone in on some more specific ones. And there are at least three verses in Zechariah nine through fourteen that refer to God. Now, now God's becoming the good shepherd. See, before he was just the shepherd. Um, but we go through Psalm twenty three. We arrive at Zechariah, and God is the good shepherd. Now I included, and we'll get to it. But on page six, I included a fourth reference. Um, but that is not showing God as a shepherd. That is simply general or general reference to shepherd language. Um, but Zechariah says, On that day the Lord their God will save them, for they are the flock of his people. For like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. Okay? And this is where... The, the reason that God is going to act, the reason that God's saving grace is going to, to be available there is they are the flock of his people. The main reason for God's saving act is not because they are his flock, but because he wants them to shine on the land like jewels of a crown. Now, that thread, the, light, the uh, salt and light, 
for the, the chosen people of Israel to be examples. Uh, that thread is still there. It's not just, boom, they are chosen. It's they are chosen for a purpose, and that purpose is to shine. So we can see both of those operational there. Um, uh, 10 to be says, therefore, the people wander like sheep. They suffer for lack of a shepherd. And I put there for you. It wasn't that they had no leaders at all, but they were not the real leaders of God that could be labeled as shepherds. Zechariah 10, I'm on the top of page 6, illustrates the contrast between human shepherds and God as a shepherd. For the Lord of hosts cares for his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them his proud war horse. Okay, that's different than the human kings and shepherds. And then 10.8 refers to the God who will gather the people of Ephraim slash Israel. I will signal or whistle for them and gather them in. For I have redeemed them and they shall be as numerous as they were before. God had scattered Ephraim by means of the Assyrian Empire. Zechariah portrays God as a shepherd whose sheep knew him even in exile. And they will answer his call. It's interesting to note that some of the Zechariah verses do, do not use the Hebrew root for shepherd, but describe what God is doing as a shepherd. So sometimes you don't see the noun shepherd but you see reference to God will save his flock. And then you go, ah, like a shepherd. <laughs> or you see God cares for his flock. Oh, that's why she included that passage. Even though the word shepherd wasn't used as a noun, we see these activities of the shepherd. Gather them in and redeem them. And um, just as a note, Four different Hebrew words are used to describe God as shepherd in these Zechariah passages. Um, now we're moving, I don't know why it's said, well, anyway. Micah writes out of the background of the Assyrian invasion. He writes from a very difficult time. It appears that the Assyrians are going to be successful in their attempt to take the whole nation for themselves. They've already taken the northern kingdom of Israel. They apparently are right at the gates of the city of Jerusalem. And the prophet Micah attempts to turn the people's attention to the Lord so that they might find deliverance. So in future weeks, we're going to look at some of these other passages. Um, for now, we're going to make a little stop in uh, Exodus. And I'm going to have to figure out what happened to everything else I had to say about Micah. Um, but now I'm on the top of page 7. What does Exodus 15 teach us about God as shepherd? I don't know if you are a student of Exodus 15 or not, but Exodus 15 is referred to as the great song of Moses. Um, it is what some people call the oldest poem in the world. Um, Moses and the Israelites sing it together after their deliverance through the Red Sea. And it's worth noting that up until Exodus 15, there has not been a single note of praise. It has been desert and complaint and desert and complaint until Exodus 15. And there we, we see an image of God as shepherd emerging because they are praising God's and Moses' faithful leadership to fruitful and safe passages. So here we have, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, it reminds me of a musical. It used to bother me. Everybody knew the song. Somehow, they, in a musical, they want to sing, I am 16 going on 17, and everybody knows the words. <laughs> Same thing here. Moses and the people of Israel sang this song. Uh, it's a miracle. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. There should be an F there to say, for he has triumphed gloriously. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, and doing wonders? 
You stretch out your right hand and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. Now, you and I might not look at that as shepherding, but they knew. The nations will hear and tremble. An anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized. See, it's not just the Egyptians. It's all the other foe and the anticipated foe. Um, the leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away because that's going to be their land of milk and honey. Terror and dread will fall on them by the power of your arm. They will be as a stone until your people pass by the Lord, until the people you want pass by. So um, I think it takes a little imagination on our part to see or hear or feel the shepherd motif that is in this Exodus 15. Um, but I think the people who have studied it more than you and I um, understand that the people understood that this was a shepherd motif. You will lead the people you have redeemed and you will guide them to your holy dwelling. Leading and guiding are two of the uh, stellar attributes of the good shepherd. The good shepherd leads and guides. The failure of the kings is that they did not lead and they did not guide. Then we go back to Isaiah 40 and we see leading gently in thy strength and to the resting place of holiness. Um, and so that, that language, again, echoes the same language from Exodus, leading, strength, and things like that. So on page 8, we revisit what we talked about in the big overview, which is why do we think God chose the shepherd motif? Well, much like the covenant motif that we've talked about before, um, it made sense to the people to whom God was speaking. There's just no point in thinking up a new metaphor to explain who you are and what you do when the point is for, to be understood, you need to choose something that the people can connect with. So shepherding was and is a popular occupation in the ancient Near East. People to whom and for whom the scriptures were first written were familiar with shepherding and sheep. And even foreign powers like the Babylonians and the Assyrians used shepherd motifs to refer to their kings. It was that prevalent. It wasn't unique to uh, the God of Moses and Abraham. King Hammurabi, you know Hammurabi's code, he called himself a shepherd. And God perhaps observed that people act like sheep. Whew, that one stings, right? Wandering and getting lost. That's my favorite one. There could have been lots of other well-known things that God chose, maybe you know, he said you'll be as numerous as the stars in the sky. It could have been something about sand. Lots and lots of things. Water in the desert. There's something special about sheep. And we'll find out what that is, but not today. What makes a good shepherd, and by analogy, a good leader? Good shepherds are focused on the flock. Those bad kings that are compared to bad shepherds have a focus on amassing wealth or uh, defeating enemies, something besides the well-being of the flock. Good shepherds are focused on the flock. The good shepherd is willing to put the needs of the sheep above their own needs. I um, don't know why this just popped into my head, but um, someone like St. Francis of Assisi or a bishop or somebody said, priests should smell like sheep. And if you think about that, that's because they're in it with the sheep. They're not distanced. And they may not like fecal matter and matted fur and bleeding wounds, but they overcome all the, that wants to distance themselves from that. And they're in it. And so they're willing to put the needs of the sheep above their own needs. That's a huge quality. We know that that's a mother quality, right? They are concerned for the flock's provision and guidance and safety with special attention to the most vulnerable. 
as in that image in Isaiah, where he brings the lambs to his breast and he is attentive to the ewes. Uh, a good shepherd provides nourishment and refreshment. Um, a good shepherd personally knows the sheep in the flock. And they know how to use a rod, which is sometimes described as a club, to ward off animals and robbers, and to use a staff to control snakes and scorpions. I always thought the rod and the staff were just to you know, poke and prod sheep, like, go here, don't go there, go here, don't go there. But they really do have a purpose in uh, warding off wild animals and robbers, and uh, you can see now how the staff would be where you pick up a snake and fling it away from your uh, herd. So what we see in this motif of a shepherd as a leader is love and care, and that's what God wants his people to have, even from the human leaders. But they fall short, repeatedly. And um, still, God is up there modeling this love and care, and, uh, and eventually he, he, God says, okay, you human shepherds just don't get it. Uh, we'll have to have the divine shepherd like we started with, right? Shepherds are considered wisdom figures, dreamers, poets, contemplatives, mystics, healers, warriors, and prophets. So there's just so much of a uh, complexity to the shepherd motif um, and the, uh, the visions that surround what makes a good shepherd. Some say to live a shepherd's life means to live simply, humbly, and fearlessly committed to the needs of others. And this is at the heart of what it means to be disciples of the Good Shepherd. So, in our last week together on this series, we'll talk about how the sheep become the shepherds. Okay? But for now, just hear these, these adjectives and these verbs about living simply and living humbly and living fearlessly and know that the shepherd is modeling that for us and calling us to do it as well. So we come to the top of page nine. I don't feel like I sped through this, but I'm going to slow down. <sighs> Shepherding is a multifaceted and constant job. Looking back again at Isaiah 40, he tends his flock like a shepherd. Not very many words, but they're packed. God assumes the responsibility for the needs of the flock. We don't count on the sheep to come up. You know, we count on our dogs to let us know when they have to go out. Um, I've often said I'm really bad with plants because they don't cry when they're hungry. I managed to raise three babies to adulthood because, you know, they let you know when they're hungry, right? Sheep just need someone to step in. And it's, God just assumes that responsibility for all ages and stages of life. He doesn't say, oh, bring them to me when they're a little steadier on their feet. He doesn't say, oh, I only do newborns. <laughs> he sticks with them. God stands between his flock and danger. Uh, my favorite stand between story is the uh, woman caught in adultery. If you ever look closely at that story, what you see is there is no question about that particular woman's guilt, okay? Nobody is arguing she didn't do it. Nobody is arguing the laws are being misinterpreted. We pretty much read the story and we agree with the everybody in the story. She did it, the laws are clear, and the people are within their rights to do what they're doing. And Jesus stands between her and the danger. That intercessory action. And that's a shepherd role. If I see the mountain lion coming to get my sheep, maybe I want to go hide in a cave and say, what's one or, one, one or two sheep down? Let the lion eat. But the shepherd's role doesn't do that. The shepherd stands between the danger and the sheep. And we can see how that becomes important in the metaphor of Jesus as the good shepherd 
who stands between the woman who's caught in adultery and the people who would throw stones at her. The danger. Um, we see that God is equipped, skilled, and willing to provide the resources for his flock. They don't beg God. We don't beg God for the resources. We got put into a world full of plenty, full of uh, animals and plants and lush, vibrant uh, things. And we have been allowed to make discoveries and inventions and, you know, we have company and family life and, and all those things we didn't even ask for. God provided those. And God plans to supply, plans ahead to supply the needs of his flock. Um, you know, we try to plan ahead as human beings, but I, I don't know that we can plan or even see how far God plans ahead. And I'm not saying that God causes a tragedy in a person's life, but I am saying that by the time a person arrives at a tragedy, there are people and resources and songs and structures in place so that that person can meet that situation. And, and that takes a lot of planning. Sometimes God had to make somebody be born so that the person will have the right spouse. Right? Um, he tends his flock like a shepherd. Not the flock. Not somebody else's flock. Not the flock of... Not a wild flock. But his flock. And then God has shepherd traits and qualities. And again, the whole purpose of a metaphor is to bring out these qualities we can't see God. We don't know God's bodily shape. We can't know God's intentions. We don't even know if God thinks or has a mind like we do, except that we're told we're made in God's image. We still don't really fully understand that. But when we look at these shepherd traits and qualities, then we are able to see that that is who God is as well. God is loyal and faithful, even in unpleasant circumstances. There are many fair weather friends in life. There are many situations. There are many jobs where as long as you're the best employee and you're hitting all the cylinders, tick, 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 they love you. Get into one messy problem personally in your life and they're like, I'm sorry, you're undependable. We can't have you. That's not how God operates. God says you're hurt, you're wounded, you feel a little under the weather, you've had the worst year of your life with deaths and setbacks, I'm still here. I still value you, and I still care. Um, God chooses to be in relationship with us. Uh, the idea here is that shepherds choose their way of life. Now you may say, oh, Teresa, isn't it true that if your dad was a shepherd, you had to be a shepherd too? Well, I don't know, okay? But I do know human beings just a little bit. And um, if you're going to be down and dirty and doing shepherd work, even if you were born into it, at some point you need to make that choice. You just, you can't do it if you're not voluntarily in that role. And, and that's what we need to understand about God. God didn't have to take it. God didn't have to make us. God didn't have to give us a world. God didn't have to take any responsibility for us whatsoever. Could have wound us up like little people, like little toys and sent us out into the world without any responsibility for us. But God has chosen over the millennia to be our shepherd. And our needs do not offend God. God is willing to be in the poop if needed, and he doesn't quit before the work is done. Oh, how we long for people in our lives who will do that. Poop is nasty. I don't like poop. Throw up is nasty. I don't like throw up either. We're, the women in this room know that we do things with throw up and poop as mothers for our children. The men in this room do things as fathers for their children. But God is modeling that for us even before we're asked to do it. 
and God doesn't quit. Uh, the shepherd doesn't go to bed until all the work is done. He doesn't just say, oh, it's five o'clock, I'm gonna give them a little bit of food, and then I'm really tired because we've hiked a long way through these mountains today. They'll be okay if I just take a nap. No, he makes sure they're secure, he checks the perimeter, he figures out where they're gonna stay the night, he, he does all of this. And then he gets up the next day and does it again. And God's approach is gentle, and God moves through his flock with an attitude of strong but gentle presence, moving calmly. This might be my favorite image or my favorite connection to God as shepherd. Um, there are lots of leaders who are harsh. There are lots of leaders who just set out the rule and say, follow it or not to your peril. The shepherd image is that person who walks among us. And that walking among us, because sheep get scared easily, that walking among us has to be done gently, if we are sheep. And that walking among us has to be strong, so the sheep can sense, this is my protector. But gentle, and this concept of moving calmly among us. I don't know, that enriches my vision of God. When I think of that shepherd figure who doesn't just stand on a hill and command sheep to do things, which they wouldn't do anyway. <laughs> um, and I see that the quality of a shepherd that God so embodies in the person of Jesus is the one who walks among us. Uh, that is huge to me, and, and, that, and that might be a new way for you to think about uh, why we use the sheep and shepherd metaphor. So God's way is personal and firm. The shepherd can feel the strength and the authority of the shepherd. How many times do human beings try to assert their authority over others in power moves and in... Uh, all kinds of physically aggressive, uh, mentally aggressive ways where they, somebody somewhere wants you to know they're in charge. That's not the shepherd's way. The shepherd is in charge. Um, and they can feel the shepherd's strength. But that is not because the shepherd is overbearing or authoritarian. Uh, but because of the, the way the shepherd carries himself. Personal and firm. I like to tell the story of when I was correcting my kindergartner, Sam. And he goes, why are you being so mean? And I said, honey, I'm not being mean. I'm being firm. Isn't Mrs. Stefanik ever firm? I was his kindergarten teacher. He said, yes, but she smiles when she's doing it. <laughs> uh, who do you think Sam felt more uh, respect for? <laughs> the smiling one. The non-smiling one was just putting him off. So it's an attitude of strong and gentle presence. Um, and the sheep feel that. Um, and this is where we go back to. He gathers the lambs with his arm and carries them close to his bosom and gently leads those who are young. God's concern is always for the youngest and the weakest. The whole of the New Testament is about speaking truth to power in a way that uh, elevates and celebrates uh, the frail and the needy and the hungry and the vulnerable. God's concern is for the weakest, and the, God sees that the weakest get special care. That's a problem for the oldest son in the parable. There he is, capable and loyal and strong, and he's got this flighty younger brother, and, and the flighty younger brother goes out. And um, it's not that God is, or the father is unconcerned with the oldest son. It's that the care and attention of the shepherd goes to the weakest, and they get special care. And here's another thing about shepherding. God does the work. Almost every other profession, somebody delegates it. 
No, here you go do that. That's a little messy, you go do that. Here is God saying, I am not too good for this. I will put on human flesh. I will come and literally walk among you. But I'm always walking among you because I am not delegating my healing work to angels and messengers. I am not delegating my presence. I'm not saying, oh, it's okay, you have Moses, you don't need me. Uh, God does the work. Uh, to carry is kindness, but to carry in the bosom is loving kindness. Uh, the bosom is the seat of love. The theologian Spurgeon said that, and I, uh, I alluded to it earlier, but now you have it in quotes, which means it's really, really, really real. So um, that's where we are in our big, big picture of God, our shepherd. Questions, thoughts before we close up? Come back next week. We'll take up uh, specifically Jeremiah and Ezekiel. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all are smart.